why would I put this woman on the cover of this thumbnail with the Romanian flag over her shoulder to symbolize Romania? Hmm? I'll tell you at some point in this video. What is a country? What is a nation? Where do these two words even begin? What's the difference between them? Romania is like water and how it moves between these two concepts. Undefinable, really, for most of its history until the recent modern age. And from the Hunnic invasions of 374 to the rising of Romanian principalities in the 1300s and the Romanian uh, references in the Hungarian chronicles before that and the, the 13th century, we have almost 800 years where we don't really know anything much that's concrete about Romania. It's a cloud, a dense fog, mysterious and often quite romantic and fanciful, but you can't build the concept of a nation on fancy. So when did this nation actually begin to become self-aware of its cultural unity in contrast to other nations around it? This is Benjamin, and that is what this video is about. When I made a video asking you what is the oldest nation in Europe, I created four categories to distinguish different claims to that by. So, law, or the legal context, recognition, sort of, faith, ethnicity, or genetics, which I'm not really liking very much, but it's a part of it, right? And culture, often language, or just a cultural awareness of the self, in terms of the nation. So those four are the categories we're going to try and measure Romania by. Well, let's get into it. Oh, genesis. That's what we're measuring. When did the true genesis of the nation come into being? How old is Romania as a nation? On the 9th of May, 1877, a man named Mihail Kogelnicianu, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, gave a speech in Parliament where he proclaimed Romania's independence from the Ottoman Empire. But in truth, this was merely a formality because to have a Minister of Foreign Affairs already means you had the structure of an independent state in place, the legal foundations of a nation. Nearly 20 years prior, in 1859, Alexandru Ioan Cruza, a hero of the 1848 revolution, was elected as prince over both Wallachia and Moldavia, creating the United Romanian Principalities. But if you think national independence in the Age of Empires is the beginning of Romania from a law perspective, you're wrong. In 1848, liberal nationalists in both principalities revolted. And whilst the revolt in Moldavia was a catastrophic failure, the revolt further south in Wallachia had some limited success. A government was set up using the Romanian tricolor flag, with laws based on the French Revolution, which sought contacts in Transylvania, attempting recognition from Hungary and the Russian Empire. This failed. But even before this, in 1821, a revolution had broken out under Tudor Vladimirescu. Not against the Ottomans, as you might expect, but their sycophants and loyal administrators. They had brought in Greeks, Fanariotes, aristocrats from older Byzantine families who had managed to survive the Ottoman conquest intact, but who were firmly under Ottoman control. And the Romanians, especially in the East, revolted against this. And even though this revolt did not go well for Vladimirescu, especially, he was tortured. He did, however, build an assembly of the people in Oltenia, 
which coordinated with rebels in the east in Moldavia. This revolt and its brief but chaotic expression of Romanian identity in a people's assembly did not just appear out of anywhere or thin air. For decades, out of the Romantic era following the Enlightenment, Romanian poets like Naum Romanicianu and Ion Budai Deleanu had called for a patriotic unification of Romanian-speaking lands. But where did they get this idea, you might ask? Well, this is because the 17th and 18th centuries were a bit of a low point for Romanian culture and nationality. I mean, stuff went on, but... and good things happened, but... It was a bit bad for them. They lost a lot of ground to other powers. Romanians were pinned between an expansive Austrian Habsburg Empire that was swallowing Hungary and appropriating its claims to Romanian lands. The Russians, who wanted puppet states to control Turks, and the Turks, who occasionally rode north and enslaved Christian virgins, murdering their families, and extracting taxes from whoever they could. So Romanian patriots after 1812, which saw their lands divided between Russians and Ottomans, looked back to the last great hurrah in their history, which came in the year 1600 with a man named Mihai Bravo or Mihai Viteazu, Michael the Brave. He was the voivode, the prince of Wallachia in the south. He began a military conquest of the other principalities. He sacked Yashi in the north east. And what he did is very peculiar. He invoked an old 1438 theme, the union of the three nations, which did not involve the Romanians. This was about the Hungarians, the Sekes, the Hungarian speakers in Transylvania, and the Saxons, the merchants and he brought their feudal system down into Wallachia. This union of the three nations was built in reaction to a peasant revolt of Romanians. So Michael the Brave was using a legal basis to ignore the rights of Romanians in Transylvania. He wasn't concerned with Romanian nationality or ethnicity in the slightest. It was about his power in Wallachia extending and overseeing the other lands. There's no suggestion of a Romanian nationality in his work, except one really important thing. He gets international recognition of a united Romania. In the Habsburg dynasty, by acknowledging their overlordship over him, which was common in the days and different layers of power in those days, he gets them to acknowledge a united polity over most of Romania. That's important. But also the Holy Roman Empire, Rudolf II, gives him military assistance at the moment when he controls this territory. So that's international recognition of a united Romania around the year 1600, briefly, for a few months. But it was there. And as we go back, we have to depend more upon what others wrote about. What others wrote about the Romanians. We know in the 16th century from Italian Renaissance writers like Tranquillo and Tranico, Francesco Dea Vella, alongside Ludovico Greti, and later Italian-speaking Dalmatians, meaning present-day Croatia, not dogs, like Antonius Ferrantio, and later Johannes Lucius, the writings of these men show us clearly that the common people, at least as far back as the 1530s, called themselves Romanians. Rome, Romaneschi, Romanians. And they said, Stiu Romaneschi, do you speak Romanian? The Romanian language has changed a bit since then, but I guess it's quite similar today. Do you speak Romanian? Let me know. And in 1521, we have the earliest surviving document written in Old Romanian, Neashku's letter, which is sent by a merchant, Lupu Neashku, to the mayor of Brasov in the Kingdom of Hungary at the time, 
Johannes Benkner, warning of an Ottoman attack, and he uses the words Tsiera Rumaniaska, Romanian land, to describe the south-facing land to the Turks, and not Wallachia, the principality. This is significant because he's communicating with someone else in Romanian outside the principality of Wallachia, and he's using the term Romanian land, insinuating there is a sense of unity between these two men in geography and identification of what Romania is. It's not exclusively these principalities, a nation above these principalities that unites them. Before 1500, all we really have are large kingdoms like Hungary and the Byzantine Empire, writing about this land as if it were on the edges of the world. And frankly, it was. If you were from any center of learning, the lands of the Lower Danube were murky and mysterious, covered by wolves and bandits, far away. Now, I'm sure to the Romanians at the time, it wasn't mysterious, it was their home. But we don't have any documents from them in their own language. The words Vlach and Roman are clearly interchangeable in this period, without any true distinction from each other, through the 12th century, 13th century, 14th century, even 15th century, and the Romanian principalities emerging in the 1300s, or in the center of this period, when they're in their tensions with Hungary, sometimes bursting up into military conflicts with Hungary. The Hungarians called them Vlachs, or Ola, but we don't know what they called themselves. King Bela III of Hungary is mentioned around 1190 as fighting a group of Bogororum et Rumeorum. This may be a reference to the Bulgarian and Vlach uprising which created the Second Bulgarian Empire, and we must remember that this had been covered by the First Bulgarian Empire, for most of 400 years, in which the Vlachs were an integral part. And as one of you noted when I mentioned I was making this video, the word empire means there is more than one nationality, and Romanians could absolutely be part of that, especially in the First Bulgarian and Vlach Empire. In 1247, King Bela IV notes small Vlach polities north of the Lower Danube, and from the 1270s, Hungarian royal charters clearly suggest economic relationships between these Vlachs or Romanians, or who would become Romanians, and the church. An epic German poem around the same time, may have mentioned Romanians, but it is very unclear. As for law and certainty, all we have before this really is the Gesta Hungarorum, the deeds of the Hungarians, which is basically a chronicle of what happened from the Hungarian conquest in the late 10th century up into the earlier Kingdom of Hungary. And it has two points in it which are important to us. Pastoris Romanorum, it says, shepherds of the Romanians, who let their sheep come down from the mountains into the Pannonian plain which the Hungarians, or the Magyars, took over. And they're writing about these people having different customs and different laws to their concept of what laws were. And secondly, they mention a specific Vlach by name, Gelo, who rules some land somewhere in Transylvania. Now, we don't know if this name was made up, we don't know if he was a Vlach, but all we have is the word of this chronicle, and it's perfectly reasonable that Vlachs were in this area at the time, but we don't know the ethnicity of these people, and for that, all we can go on is DNA. Here she is. I told you I would come back to her some point, somewhere in this video. Why a woman? Because the DNA marker on Romanians, a majority of them at least, is very unusual. There are two points 
in their history when most of the male population is clearly wiped out. The Indo-Europeans who came in 3000 BCE or so, I mean we're talking like over 5000 years ago. There was a wave, maybe from plague, maybe it wasn't war, but we don't know. And around the upper Danube, the men are wiped out. Also in the period after Rome invades, so the second century going towards the fourth century, there's a depletion of the male population that is severe. Again, we don't know what happened. There's no evidence that it was like a genocide or some kind of horrible thing like that. Maybe they were relocated. We don't know. But when the Goths came in, there was chaos and anarchy. So who knows? But also, within this population, they share DNA markers with Sardinia and the Basques in pre-Indo-Europe. There's a pre-Indo-European layer. It's not a majority, but it's there as a significant chunk of the pie. But as far as DNA, I don't really like this term. These concept of these concepts of ethnogenesis. As if your ethnicity defines your nationality. It's good to be proud of your heritage, absolutely, and I might make a video about my own DNA test. Would you like that? But Ethnicity does not define nationality, and so I tread around it very carefully because there's a lot of conspiracy type YouTubers out there who make weird DNA videos about the Scythians or the Celtic underlayer or just all kinds of nutty fanciful nonsense. I want to stay away from that kind of nationality because it leads to megalomania. But you can't ignore the ethnicity, and I do consider it valid. It's just not the determining factor in a nation. It can tell us things about the past, and we know that you Romanians should thank your women. Because whatever you have left from pre-Roman times, it wasn't the men who brought it forward. The women survived and brought it forward. Whatever's left is thanks to your mothers. One interesting thing about the DNA marker on these Romanians is that the northern Carpathians along the ridge separating uh, Marmores, northern Romania, from the Ukraine, Poland, there's a difference there. Once you cross over those mountains, the people are very different. And that's ancient. That's an ancient difference from those first Indo-European migrations that's still there. And the DNA actually supports that Romanians or Vlachs came up from the south to become Romanians because they're most like Bulgarians and Macedonians genetically out of any other people. It doesn't mean that's exactly what happened. It just means that could have been part of what happened, a migration north. As far as this composition, it's like I said, it's very unique because it's a hodgepodge of different things, which isn't very similar to anywhere else. And as the DNA was kind of settling, into a, a more solid shape of what it would be today. That's the exact moment at which Christianity began to make inroads into Romania, especially along these Danube frontier fort towns, in which these people who followed this new faith of Christianity were protected from persecution, and there were mass killings of Christians for a while. But the point is, at the moment, in the 4th century, Romania began to change spiritually as its DNA was settling down. And this new faith would change Romania forever. Mm -hmm. 
most folk, when saying what their nation is or what a nation is, don't seem to understand that the nation state did not exist before 1648 as a concept. At that 1648 moment, Sweden was basically given the Baltic Sea. France's borders were made more solid. Spain was recognized as being a nation among others, not over others. Both the Netherlands and Switzerland were legally recognized as independent republics, and the seeds were planted in Prussia that would eventually lead to the militarization of an imperial united Germany. And all of that happened because Europe had been plunged into 120 years of religious war. And the way they found peace was essentially the creation of modern nationalism through religious tolerance. Limited tolerance. Hmm? Where this relates to Romania is that in 1859, when Alexander Ioan Cusa was elected prince over the two principalities of Wallachia and Moldova, he immediately began working to create a united Romanian Orthodox Church. Along the lines of 1648's aftermath and agreements between limited tolerance and the nation state, by taking the property of Greek Orthodox monasteries, basically he nationalized the church and sucked out the money from other affiliations. To proclaim complete independence in matters of faith from independence from the Constantinople Patriarchate, a relic of the Byzantine Empire. And I don't have time in this video to go into that or the ecclesiastical colonization that Hungary attempted in parts of Romania, but there was a religious war going on beneath any violence with the founding of institutions and monasteries in different and key positions and the Russian Empire's church in Moscow. This was only possible because there was already a deep religious foundation in Romania that was many centuries old, and which, as it grew, defined itself against Catholicism and later variant forms of Protestantism. The Hungarian-speaking part of Romania is not just different linguistically, but also in faith. And this reflects a different national gravity and culture, taking on changes that Hungary did, and in some cases, taking on changes that Hungary didn't, but still being a bit different from Romanian-speaking Romania. But as for Romania, an astounding 86% or 80%, considering how you count it, that area, that margin, consider themselves to be part of this Romanian Orthodox faith. That is a national consciousness of faith. But how old is this? When did it begin? What was the genesis of this? How old is this in relation to national Romanian identity? In the year 348, Goths expelled Christians and Ufalos, see my video on the Goths, a man who went around preaching the gospel, was expelled from the land. So clearly this was not part of a national faith yet. Then in the 6th century, Justinian the Great brought a Christian renaissance in the south and southeast, in Dobruja. But again, this was an external power imposing a faith upon Romania. And from the 7th to 10th centuries, with Avars, Bulgars, and then yet to be Christianized Slavs expanding into these lands. Christianity fell back for a while, and not until the Bulgarian Empire converts to Christianity in the late 9th century does Christianity begin to push back north over the Danube. Orthodox Bulgarian Christianity. Further north, beyond Romania, the Kingdom of Hungary began conversion to Catholic Christianity, culminating with King Stephen's conversion in the year 1000. And the Vlachs, who would become the Romanians, see my video on them, existed on some kind of Latin remnant continuum, with a large group 
probably in present-day Bulgaria and Macedonia, moving north to join scattered groups of Vlachs who were already there. We don't know, actually, exactly what these movements of peoples were. We don't know. There's a few different theories of how the Romanian people formed, but we don't exactly know. It's pretty much assumed there was a migration north, but there may have been people in the north already. For this video's sake, it's clear by the 11th century we're talking about a deeply Christian people who have been influenced as such by the Bulgarian Empire they were a part of, and often in opposition to the Catholic Empire, or Kingdom of Hungary to the Northwest, but the Christian Schism happened in 1054. That's true, but East and West were already dividing in terms of spiritual belief and nature before then. It's just it was a bit finalized in the 11th century. The developments were already taking place, and the drift East, certainly in Romania, the drift East in Romania was already happening before 1054. In 1234, Pope Gregory the Ninth. There were a lot of Gregories, I suppose. He sent a papal bull, which is an official document, to the heir to the throne of Hungary, Prince Bella, where he complains that the Wallachi, that's the Wallachians, or the Romanians, are orthodox with their own bishops. This means by the 13th century, those who would become the core of Romania and the principalities, especially of Wallachia, but also in Moldavia, were already being defined by others as being in opposition to the ecclesiastical colonization of their lands. Ecclesiastical, to do with the church, related through Latin to egluis, the Welsh word for church. And again, this was, like I mentioned earlier, ecclesiastical colonization. Hungary inserted Catholic monasteries in places that were between emerging polities in Romania to try and divide these people from each other and expand Catholic positions between Romanian settlements. It was very clever. It almost worked, but the Romanians pull off an unexpected victory now and then. When Wallachia and Moldavia emerged politically in the next century, these princes found they could use Orthodox churches to wage cultural warfare and expand their political power, as the Kingdom of Hungary had, against them. And it is here in the 14th century, with the fusion of political power, that a national Romanian religious consciousness and self-awareness truly matures. These structures, political and religious, are built in the soil of a culture that is already there at this point, and already old. One of the most striking things about Romanian culture is its folk culture, the strength of it. This is a deeply rural, rural, rural country with a low population density compared to most of Europe anyway. And this depth of strength and this folkness means there's probably quite a bit of pre-Roman things that have survived in a residual element at least. But how much we cannot be certain. But the weaving, the woodwork, the church architecture, it's distinct because of this rural influence that has held a distinct culture, even in the age of globalization and even through communism, which flung its most talented out of the basket or into prison. By the way, communism in Romania allowed, for the first time truly in Romanian history, for a creative diaspora of people beyond its borders to develop Romanian culture in isolation from Romanian culture and then come back into Romania. So that's a bit of a rebirth there, but that's very modern and it's very beyond the genesis of the nation. As for the genesis of the nation, 
There's three real periods, I believe, that encapsulate a potential to be the beginning of this nation in terms of self-awareness that it exists in the minds of the people. So you have the earlier, the earlier time in the first Bulgarian Empire. This was 681 until 1018. Most of the more populated areas were under the rule of the Bulgars, or this empire, when it converted to Christianity, and this forever etched that moment of spiritual awakening into the Romanian people, because they didn't turn towards Catholicism when it split. The next one, as opposed to the earlier time period, which was probably 10th century about, this one would have happened in the 13th century, a political consciousness that these states would exist, these principalities. And this was the birth of Wallachia and Moldavia. And this period would have stretched from about 1290 until about 1350. Establishment of institutions, princes. Now those two are cultural. And the third one is as well. It's a national reawakening that you see in the 19th century, from 1821 with the failed revolution, which it had some successes in that it brought about the bringing back of Romanian princes, but not independence. Until independence and after it, 1878, there was this flood of Romanian writers, Romanian dictionaries, encyclopedias, the arts, ideas of the French Revolution, societies to study their own culture, operas, paintings, etc. A real national consciousness in the romantic, academic, pluralistic, cultural sense to hold, very much in the romantic mold of the era. And so these three, an early medieval, a high medieval feudal state culture, and then a national, a nation states. Which one of these was where the culture obtained a national consciousness, a genesis for the first time? So how old is Romania as a nation? Between that moment, whenever the majority of Romania had tilted toward this Bulgarian Christianity, sometime around the year 1000, I would say, maybe we'll go back into the, to 950. Between that and the foundation of Moldavia, which was the second principality, where they firmly knew that they could govern themselves as opposed to being part of this Bulgarian Empire, or part of this Kingdom of Hungary, or just swept over by various phases of nomads from the Eurasian steppe. At that point, between 950 and 1350, there's the foundation, certainly, of a Romanian consciousness that is national in scope. But when in that 400 years, when in that 400 years was it complete. I don't know, and we just don't have enough records to say. And that's part of what makes Romania so interesting. We can say with certainty, so many nations, when, about, when, down to the decade in some cases, when they became a nation in concept. With Poland, it's quite easy. With France, it's relatively easy. With Wales, it's a bit less easy, but it's there. But with Romania, it's, it's less certain. You're never going to be able to pin down exactly when this consciousness of nationality formed. And so I can't tell you how old Romania is, because there's never going to be any true agreement on how old Romania is. How old do you think it is? Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you in the next episode. Catch me on Patreon, leave a coffee, leave a super like, and till next time.